Hello, and welcome to Co-op for Kid Goes Live. My name is Kelly Goodell, and I'm the Regional Coordinator for Prevention Services at the COAD Early Learning and Education Division. COAD is a child care resource and, and agency for 31 counties in Eastern Ohio. This broadcast is brought to you today in partnership with the Ohio Children's Trust Fund and the Eastern Ohio Prevention Council, both who are seeking to provide child abuse and neglect prevention services in Belmont, Carroll, Coshocton, Guernsey, Harrison, Jefferson, Monroe, Muskegon, Noble, and Tuscarawas County. Thank you for joining us today. We are live and on site in New Philadelphia at our co-ed offices. Um, today, my guest is Kristen Benz. She is a consultant here at co-ed, and welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself, and we're gonna be talking about infants today. And so, I know this is a, a, a topic close to your heart. Um, just tell me a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into talking about the infant years. Um, well, I have been in the field of working with infants and toddlers for the past probably 14 years. Um, I went to Kent State University for college and graduated mm -hmm. with my bachelor's. It was actually in human development and family studies with a focus on youth development. Mm -hmm. So, for me, it was kind of a real broad degree like I wasn't sure what exactly I was going to go into but I wanted mm -hmm. to work with kids mm -hmm. in some way so um, shortly after college I ended up working for um, Help Me Grow here in New Philly okay. so that was the first job that I started with mm -hmm. and that was a lot of home visits and working with families mm -hmm. of children that were birth to three mm -hmm. so I started out there and I did that for about a year and a half and then the position came open for the toddler specialist here so I came over here and I was here for eight to nine years mm -hmm. and then I became a stay-at-home mom so I stay at home with my two boys that are 10 and 5 and I am just a consultant for mm -hmm. training. So. so from early on in your career infant and toddlers seem to be your yep. area of specialization so that's great because it, through the Help Me Grow and through an infant uh, toddler specialist here at COAD so that's one reason why I wanted to talk to you today because I know that this is something that is your area of specialization and something that as I said near and dear to your mm -hmm. heart and so when we get into talking about infants, I think at, you know, from a, a parenting perspective, from a childcare perspective, from just you know, being out in society and in the world and in our communities, there's infants everywhere. And sometimes I feel you know, as parents, we kind of walk in and there's not a manual that yes. comes along with, with a newborn, um, nor is there a, a magic wand that, that you can use. But what I'd like to talk about today is just what are some of the basic things that we can learn about infants um, and how they learn, what can we do as parents and caretakers and grandparents to help just stimulate and, and give them a great first step um, as they come out into the world and, and we want them to be successful as they move on. So that's gonna be our basic kind of um, parameters today and so I'm really interested in hearing about what you recommend and, and some of the things from your experiences and your education and, and all that, that that you would say are the, the key concepts that anyone who's interacting with an infant needs to know. Okay, um, and like you said in the beginning, an infant shows up and it's like we're supposed to magically know what to do with them. And, and that's so not real life. It's not real life. <laughs> um, it's scary to get a newborn because you don't know exactly what to do, what are they going to do, are they sleeping too much, are they awake too much. Mm -hmm. um, so I talk about that a lot in my trainings about, you know, just because you have a baby, it doesn't automatically click on the child development side of your brain mm -hmm. that says this is what you're supposed to do. And for parents and providers even to not feel bad asking questions about what should I do with the infant or are they supposed to be doing this? Should I be holding them more? Should I be laying them on their tummy? There's so many questions that go along with infants mm -hmm. and there's so many things that I think people are scared to ask because they don't want to feel like they don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. A baby is a big mystery and yes. <laughs> it takes, I mean I can teach classes and I have my own but yet I still had questions of even my own. And I've been to plenty of trainings and gotten a lot of certificates and stuff and still don't know all the answers mm -hmm. for it. So Because one, it, there, there's the basic foundational, but every child is different. Yes. And what works well as maybe a soothing technique for this yes. child may not work for this child. Yes. And so not only is it 
a mystery, mm -hmm. but it's also a very personal mystery that yes. we as parents, providers, grandparents, etc., mm -hmm. have to kind of get to know yeah. what's going to work. It's trial and error. It is trial and error. And babies are born with a temperament. And so you have your easygoing babies, mm -hmm. you have your slow to warm up babies that are a little, you know, kind of shy, mm -hmm. and then you also have your feisty babies. And knowing their temperament from the moment they're born will help you deal with mm -hmm. how they're going to act and how they're going to be because if you have a very feisty child, that child isn't going to want to probably even maybe not even be held a lot because they want to be on their own mm -hmm. or they might want something constant in front of them whether it be music or mm -hmm. toys and then you have your ch children that are easygoing that kind of don't care mm -hmm. you know the babies that'll sit in the swing be held you know mm -hmm. they don't really care they don't fuss a lot so I mean, it's trial and error it, just, it is just try different things and their temperament mm -hmm. so maybe trying all of those things you just said as examples mm -hmm. to see what works yes. and then once you find something that works it may not work forever because nope, it changes <laughs> but you know it, it's the constant you know kind of learning process yes. for whoever is caring for that child and at the moment so Correct. it's I think it's important to be supportive of parents and and providers that to always keep that in mind yeah because they they're little personalities they're they're gonna right. change um, what works today may not work tomorrow, but you just exactly. have to be willing to, to try. Yes, and I've always told providers too, like you said, if one thing doesn't work, it doesn't mean it's not going to work for the next kid. Mm -hmm. Like to always try, and you also have to give up to 30 days for something to work when mm -hmm. you're trying something new, and most people give up around like the fifth or sixth try. Mm -hmm. Like if it hasn't worked yet, they're like, it's not going to work. Well, you mm -hmm. have to give it almost a month. I always tell providers and parents, give yourself a whole month of doing the same thing. And then if it doesn't work by the end of that month, we have to try something different. And I'm sure that's challenging. It's hard, it's hard to stick because to Because that's it. frustrating. If they're, you know, frustrating. It's, especially when you're trying different things mm -hmm. um, and, and giving that time. But I can see where just even um, how habits form in adults. Yes, it, it's a time. time. It's, it's a time thing. Whether mm -hmm. you're breaking a bad habit <laughs> yes. or starting a healthy habit, yes. it takes time. Yeah. And so I think perhaps we get ourselves into the situation where we're trying to work with this little one because mm -hmm. it's harder to meet their needs. It's We want yes. them to be soothed. We want them to be happy. We want them to be content. Yes. So and not all babies are. And they may not be. And it is okay. And I think that's frustrating because if you have a child that is always crying or doesn't mm -hmm. seem happy, trying to figure out what's going on mm -hmm. or why they're unhappy, why are they crying? Mm -hmm. It could be a medical reason. It could just be a simple reason as they want to do something, but yet they can't verbalize it to mm -hmm. us what's wrong. Mm -hmm. I've always said, and as from a parent perspective, that the worst thing for me with my kids was not knowing if they had a headache. Mm -hmm. You know, is that why they're so upset? Does their tummy hurt? Because they can't tell you. Mm -hmm. So for infants, it's super hard because they can't verbally tell you anything other than their cries. Work. Yeah, and providers will say it, and so will parents that certain cries mean certain things, mm -hmm. and they do. And it's a, and that takes time to learn those it takes those a lot cues. Of time. That that mm -hmm. is their only way to communicate. So recognizing yeah. and observing observing their verbal cues can add some insight, and maybe mm -hmm. you'll be able to figure out that hey, that's the I'm hungry cry, or yes. wow, I'm not feeling well cry. Um, and I think for new parents, especially if they don't have a lot of experience working, you know, with children or or siblings or nieces and nephews, etc., mm -hmm. for a lot of new parents, that's really that's one of the hard parts. It is, and it's it's a time, and so it's okay for everyone to take time yes. to learn and observe mm -hmm. and just kind of um, get into their own rhythm with their child and and not be frustrated Correct. or yeah. or you know just. Give it the time that it deserves and needs. It's a learning experience for you as a parent mm -hmm. and for a new provider that's just getting this child that doesn't know mm -hmm. them. It's a learning experience mm -hmm. for them. And then the child's also learning how to adapt to a parent and to a different provider that's mm -hmm. watching them. I mean, there's a lot of different scenarios I think you can put them into. Um, some of the things that I had wanted to start with was that infancy, we tend to think of it just at birth. Mm -hmm. But from the moment a child is conceived and you're carrying them for nine months and during those nine months they can hear mm -hmm. and they're moving around so there's lots of movement that's happening and just the sounds that they can hear so we always try to say you know let them recognize your voice read them books 
play music, sing to them, just little things so that they can already hear mm -hmm. that constant Which could voice. help soothing process. It does help, I think, the soothing process later on because when they hear your voice again once they're here, mm -hmm. that's the calming voice to them because it's the voice that they've heard and known for nine months. And so they tend to calm more for it. Say, for instance, if dad or grandma or grandpa, whoever's around a lot, if they're not talking a lot and don't hear them, once they hear that voice, they're not as familiar with it, but as soon as they hear mom's voice, mm -hmm. it's like that calming effect of like, oh no, where's she at? And they're looking around because they can hear that familiar voice mm -hmm. and it calms them. Mm -hmm. So I've always said, even if you have multiple children that you're working with or multiple children of your own at home, if a baby is crying, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go over and pick them up. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you have, if you're feeding one in a high chair and there's one crying, you have two arms, you know, two <laughs> hands that can't do everything. Talk to the baby that's over there mm -hmm. and they should calm down in a way, maybe not completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people, when I say that, expect them just to be quiet and be like, oh, oh okay. The magic. And again, magic. Can, yeah, <laughs> magic. And magic, it would be nice if we just, whoo, and everyone is good and quiet. But they hear your voice and they'll start to calm mm -hmm. because they know you're there. Mm -hmm. Us telling them, like, I'll be there in five minutes. A baby doesn't know what five minutes is. And five minutes is an eternity mm -hmm. for a baby. But them knowing that you're giving them cues of, I'm still here, I hear you, mm -hmm. I'm just busy because you can't drop everything for one to go to the next. Mm -hmm. So talking to them and getting that familiar sound out to mm -hmm. them is letting them know that, okay, someone's here, they're coming at some point, mm -hmm. because your receptive language hits first. Okay. So receptively, they'll be able to understand you. Mm -hmm. Exactly when you say bottle, how they get like, oh, they perk mm -hmm. up a little. Because after you've said that so many times, they hear bottle and when they see it, they're like, milk, milk mm -hmm. is coming. Mm -hmm. But they can't tell you, like, that's great, bring on the bottle. Yes. They can't do that. Uh -huh. So receptively, they're understanding things. So the more you talk to them and give them those cues, I think the more that they start to mm -hmm. calm down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some kids, though, will sit there and scream the whole time. Mm -hmm. and that's their temperament. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be happy until you go over, pick them up, and give them what they need. So mm -hmm. it, de it really depends on the child. Mm -hmm. We also talked about you know windows of opportunity mm -hmm. and, and how we can um, really just kind of start that recognizing mm -hmm. early. This is a window I can start introducing something, or and we've talked about voice and as a receptive language being the first thing. So, what are some other windows that, that yeah, you would I know this is help people <laughs> recognize because maybe we're just might be missing that because sometimes we don't know as new parents. Yeah, um, we don't know what we don't know. So, we don't, and and this actually can expand all the way through adulthood. These windows of opportunity. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about with providers because I think it really gets them thinking about, mm -hmm. oh, there are specific times when someone should be learning. Mm -hmm. And in trainings, when I was taught this, it was a brain development training and I remember thinking like, oh no, like I don't want to go to a brain development training because when you think about the brain, you think about all these connections and big words and I'm like, it's just not going to be interesting. It was probably one of the best trainings that I ever went to and one of my favorite ones to train on. And so when I do it, we talk about these windows and we always tell providers to think of all these windows in their brain. So picture little windows. And these windows are either open, they're either shut where there's a crack, or they're like pretty much completely shut. For us as adults, most of ours are completely shut. They're, there are maybe a few limited ones that have cracks in them, but infants, their windows are open, most of them. Now there are certain time periods where like the language window is open. Mm -hmm. That's when you shove all the language through and they learn it. So receptively, they're understanding words you're saying. So bottle, mom, dad, brother, who constant things that they hear every day. They understand it. So then once that window is getting filled with all that receptive stuff, your expressive window like opens up. Mm -hmm. That's when you start to hear different sounds come. Now those windows slowly start to close. So there is a specific time period. So we always say like from birth to about five is about the biggest age gap that you have to shove language in mm -hmm. and to get all those language skills going. After that, that window has a crack in it. 
So to shove language in there or to get language out is really hard because say for instance, you had a speech delay. If we wait too long for that speech delay, we're trying to go backwards now to fix it when it should have been fixed a lot trying sooner. Trying to prop the window open again. And we can't prop it. And so it's a struggle for us. Mm -hmm. So it'll be the same for any of their motor development, their fine motor development. There are stages that each child goes through and they'll show you when they're ready. If they are showing interest in like pulling themselves up or you know just pushing up on their tummies, mm -hmm. let them do it. That's the time that they're gonna do it, and that's their window. It's open, mm -hmm. and after it kind of goes closed, not as much happens. So, so that's letting them initiate too. So yes. whether it's mimicry of correct. Of, so for pre language development, it's that mimicry of yeah. of, of tones of of yep. sounds. <laughs> that that that's your cue. Let the windows open. Yes. And it's the same for um, their development of the motor skills or fine motor. All kids are different, so developmentally, they're all gonna do it at different times. Mm -hmm. So I've always told parents too, the magic um, walking stage. Everybody, you know, if you read books and stuff, they're like, at the age of one, mm -hmm. and I said, it's not like on their birthday they're gonna pop out of bed and walk for you, but the books tell us that. And mm -hmm. so in our minds, we're thinking, you're one, why aren't you walking? Because not all one-year-olds walk. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have eight-month-old children that walk. We have 14-month-old kids that walk. Mm -hmm. As long as their kids are showing some sort of development of whether it be pulling themselves up to stand, um, cruising along furniture, it's there. It's just they haven't let go. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But that window is there. They're learning it. And, they're and that's when you start it. encouraging it. Yeah, you and... encourage it. You don't say like, oh, no, I don't want you to do this right now. We need to encourage it. Mm -hmm. The rolling over, the crawling, it all has its specific stage. Mm -hmm. But once those windows start to close, it's really hard to teach someone. The best example is, I mean, it's for adults, but when we get, we don't learn, at least I didn't learn Spanish or any other foreign language until high school. And trying to shove Spanish in me was really hard because I should have learned that when I was young. And your window was Between open. that birth to five period is when I should have started learning it. And now that's my biggest encouragement to parents and providers is if you want to encourage a different language, even sign language, mm -hmm. do it when they're little because they will catch on because that's when the windows open. Mm -hmm. In most schools now, my son's school does, he's been doing Spanish since preschool. Mm -hmm. And he did sign language in um, when he was in child care. So, mm -hmm. so that really he had that exposure early. And it won't be a brand new concept, concept that we need to go back Correct. and teach. So the windows are really, mm -hmm. they're neat to talk about. And it's kind of um, a neat analogy to put it. is Because if, if you think about your brain with windows and them opening and shutting, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll make sense to parents, too, that, oh, my child is interested in this. Like, I need to go along with it. But you also can't push something that isn't ready. Yes. Because if that window's not open and we're trying to push it, then that makes it kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's also really important to, to just reiterate that children develop at their own pace. Correct. They're going to be giving their own cues. And I think parents become worried and frustrated. They do. And you know, we'll be talking about um, resources, and we've talked about resources in the communities where if you are worried, and you are concerned, then mm -hmm. you know there are, are resources in your in your community yeah. um, to help you decide if yeah. this is something that that is a concern or if this is just your child's speed that they're right. working on and that they haven't. So I think parents become worried, and, and it's okay. Like they have to. My biggest thing for parents is like they need to bring up those concerns, whether it be to a pediatrician, a child care provider that they're with. Um, Bring up those concerns because most child care providers do a developmental screening on the kids. That screening will tell where they're at, if mm -hmm. they're doing okay, if they're falling behind in a specific area. Mm -hmm. And just because they're falling behind, I've always said don't use those red flags as something is seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. A red flag is just let's monitor this development to see where we go. Mm -hmm. Do we need to refer you on, you know, maybe to early mm -hmm. intervention or help me grow? and get the help that's needed. Because you wanna do that help now mm -hmm. versus saying, well, let's just keep waiting and see how they do. Mm -hmm. Get it now so that you don't have to wait. It's, mm -hmm. it's easier. I think it would be also be important to talk about for parents who may have missed a window. Correct. We know that life is easier and if, oh, you're, yeah. if you're able 
to interact with your child and do that, mm -hmm. but sometimes circumstances may have gotten in the way. Correct. And but I think it's important that we share that that's not. Um, it's not something that's overcoming or, no. or that, that those challenges can be overcome. Correct. It just will take additional Longer. support mm -hmm. and and um, resources to yeah. to to open up those windows a mm -hmm. little bit more. Um, because I think that's another part where parents, we put such uh, and, and providers put a lot of pressure on themselves. Correct. And sometimes life, you know, does it have in the way. it gets in the way, and we may have missed. Um, you know the broad opening of the window, but yeah. it doesn't mean that it's always going to be closed. And so we exactly. talk about like you know as we go on later in life. But I think that's another concern for parents. We're constantly um, just looking back at ourselves, like, oh, could I have done this better? Well, there's of course it, we learning. Could. Like <laughs> learning never ends. It never ever ends. Um, it, it doesn't. And I mean, even if their child is sick and in the hospital, anytime a child goes outside of what they're used to. Mm -hmm. So if we, if your baby gets sick, I mean, it is his flu season and RSV has been bad. If they're stuck in the hospital, even if it's only for a week, developmentally, they get behind already because they're missing those interactions that cue the parts of the brain of maybe language, of movement, of fine motor, mm -hmm. the cognitive skills that they're learning because they're not doing that while they're in the hospital mm -hmm. as much. And so they might slip back a little bit, but it doesn't mean they can't they catch up. It's not it back unsurmountable. Up. It's, it's not. It's it, you can catch up as fast as you want, depending on who's there to you know get you to go. Mm -hmm. um, my youngest was in the hospital a lot, and my biggest fear, because I knew too much, was worried about attachment mm -hmm. and that. I mean, it goes down to our question on like, what is a basic need of an infant is security. They need to have an attachment from right after birth. I mean, as soon as they're born, they will attach to somebody. Mm -hmm. It's usually a parent or a caregiver that's going to take care of them. Um, anyone that's going to take care of them, they should attach to. Once they have that attachment, they can learn. If they don't have a good attachment, they don't learn as well as they should because they don't feel secure and they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel secure and safe, you're not going to learn anything mm -hmm. because you're nervous about everything. Mm -hmm. Your basic need. Yeah. And so when my son was born, I was worried because he was in the hospital and I couldn't hold him for the first seven days. And I know that it's super important to hold them. And I practically was in his incubator with him because cuddled around him as much as I could because I knew like this is so important that he is attached. And he is attached now. I mean, he, <laughs> he might be overly attached, but it worked. he's there. It worked. But as a parent, I knew just from what I had been taught through my jobs, the importance of attachment and how it helps the child grow and learn. And so mm -hmm. that's something that parents need to be aware of. And then also providers need to be aware that when a new infant comes to your classroom, that infant's going to attach to one of the providers in that room. There's usually two to three providers in the infant room. But a lot of times providers will feel like, but that baby likes that, you know this teacher more than me. And I'm like, no, they don't, they're attached to them. And that's all that we should be worried about is that they're attached because that makes them feel good. They're happy to be there. They're comfortable. And for a parent to see that when they drop their baby off, mm -hmm. it gives them that sense of peace that my child is okay here. They're comfortable and they're happy. And they're just fine. And they'll learn. Mm -hmm. They'll learn in that environment because they do feel safe there. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing for kids, especially babies, is that they feel safe. Another topic that we wanted to really kind of get to is we talked about our windows in the brain mm -hmm. and that sense of security, senses, and, and oh, yeah. then how infants learn from a sensory oh, yes. perception. They do. Um, oh, babies, I love babies, and they, they will chomp on anything. Mm -hmm. Everything goes to their mouth, so you have to be really aware of what you give them or what's in the environment that they're in. Child care providers usually don't have anything that shouldn't be in with babies. However, if there are older children, like mobile children, walking around these young babies, we had always called it the whirlpool effect, that babies will get whatever falls in front of them because, mm -hmm. and it gets swirled around because we have these mobile infants mm -hmm. going and dropping and they're grabbing because that's typical. They see something, they want it. Because they learn what something is by touching it, by smelling it, by eating it. I mean, mm -hmm. everything goes in and out of mouths. 
and it's important to let it happen. And I think it gets frustrating to parents, to providers, because every two seconds, they give them a clean toy, it goes in their mouth, and they put it down, you have to get it and disinfect it because of all the germs. So it's important to give them different feels. So we have to have a lot of sensory, like mats. And a lot of these you can make on your own. You don't have to go to the store and buy anything special. You can get your freezer bags, and you can even put either water or gel in them and just put different materials. So whether it be little bugs or just anything bright that would catch their eye, put it in it, seal it, tape it up, um, get some duct tape and mm -hmm. tape it. I always double bag them mm -hmm. and tape them, and then they have their own sensory mat. It doesn't really cost you anything because most of the stuff you have at home anyways. Um, rough textures, mm -hmm. give them carpet, carpet, frozen washcloths, you know, yes. dry washcloths, just the different textures that they can put in their mouth. And, and the see. more of the those, more the better. you know, different sensory experiences, then they become more comfortable with it and then, then they can go on to the next one and keep exploring. Yes. So what, that recognition of, oh, yeah, this is, this is, this a, is, this is a, a surface that I don't like. Yes. And you'll see Correct. that they will just like, okay, it's not my favorite, but yeah. I really like this soft one over yeah. here. Um, and, and they so that's might just feel like your sweater, mm -hmm. and then they might just keep going at it because mm -hmm. to them they're like, "What is this?" Mm -hmm. You know, and then they will try to eat it and realize, "Ew!" Yeah. Like it doesn't or, taste good, but I like <laughs> okay. it. But I like how it feels. I like how it feels, and we encourage them to put babies on their tummies together on the floor. And this sometimes I would always get the look like, "Nope, not doing it," because they all attack each other. They don't attack each other. It's like, "Oh, your hair!" Like. They see it, and then they feel it, and then they grab. Mm -hmm. And they are not grabbing to be mean you know, or to be like, I'm going to pull your hair out. They're grabbing because... I want to know you. I want to know who you are. I want to know what this is on your head. Because, it, you know, especially mm -hmm. the babies have the little spiky hair. Mm -hmm. It looks interesting. Babies first learn how to grasp. So if I was a baby and I grabbed your hair right now, I could grab it, but I couldn't let go because I don't know how to. So babies don't know how to open their hands first. They know how to grab, but that's it. And that sounds like a really good window to it, teach them. Teach them that. <laughs> like, this is how we let go. Because it, even if you give them, I mean, if you're trying to pry their hand off their hair or if they have their shirt, if they're holding a toy, we always have to like pry their hands open because they, they haven't figured that out mm -hmm. yet. And so it's good to know that so that you understand why they're grabbing each other. Or if you know a child is really into that at that moment, don't sit them right beside another baby. Sit them in front of a basket of toys. Who may not be in that same area and responding well Correct. to that tactile invasion. Yeah, because it might be too much for them. Mm -hmm. So you have to really learn what stage they're at and what to do with them. So mm -hmm. me laying some toys in front of them and sitting them nearby someone, but not right on top of them because they can grab the toys, mouth on the toys, mm -hmm. instead of grabbing the child beside them. Or put them in front of a mirror, because babies don't understand that that's them in front of the mirror. They just know it's something looking at them, smiling, cooing, chewing on toys. Oh, cute. They think it's, yeah, <laughs> they find it quite comical. Like, this is fantastic. Eventually, as they get older, then they learn like, oh, that's me. Mm -hmm. But they don't know that. So if you, if all the other babies are sleeping and there's one up, Put them in front of a mirror and they will entertain themselves. Excellent. So. I'm going to go through and just kind of recap a little bit about mm. what we've talked about. Um, we've talked about our windows of, of learning and just recognizing them and, and being able to um, recognize them and then encourage whatever that window seems to be open. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we've talked about you know infancy and birth and, and just that visual cue and, and verbal cues that, that our babies and learning the temperament of our child and, and being okay and having the patience to yes. try different techniques, to, to try different ways of um, encouraging learning, mm -hmm. recognizing where the child is, recognizing the temperament. Those are all really important things. Right. And, and these are, we're talking about kind of broad scopes with some, some good specific mm -hmm. strategies. Um, but I think it, it's important that we just encourage everyone to let their child be their child. Correct. When, if you have concerns, take them to a professional and, or, mm -hmm. or, or to someone that you trust. Um, if you have worries, because it can be challenging yeah. and frustrating. Um, mm -hmm. And then also just creating an environment where learning can happen. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be anything expensive. It doesn't no. have to be anything. And then probably just to, to wrap up is sometimes we miss those windows. And sometimes we do, we do that. And 
um, and it's, it's well. and, and, and every parent does mm-hmm. the most perfect parent I've missed windows and, and you know <laughs> and, and professionals um, it's okay because yeah. it, it can learning is a lifelong process yeah um, there might be some stumbles along the way but it's just you know there there's always hope mm-hmm. um, and children are resilient right. and and they want to learn so I think um, that's how I'd like to wrap up today because I think we talked about so many things and I think in future broadcasts we'll talk about more of these specific yeah. strategies with that um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us I want to thank you mm-hmm. Kristen for You're coming welcome. and talking about your passion today um, I feel like you have a lot more knowledge to share with us okay. and I hope you'll join us for future broadcasts um, we'll be returning next week and with our next broadcast continuing with um, help me grow which is mm-hmm. a uh, a local community resource that is available for parents yeah. if they would have any concerns about their infants and toddlers. So um, look for that in our future broadcast. And if you have any questions today about anything we talked about or have questions yeah. for Kristen or myself um, or any of our, our community resources, please feel free to go online here on Facebook and, and post your question or post your comments and we would love to get back to you and help direct you into um, any services that, that may benefit you or answer your questions. So thank you very much and thank you for joining Coed for Kid Goes Live.